Welcome to the How We Can Heal podcast. My name is Lisa Danilchuk, and I'm a psychotherapist specializing in complex trauma treatment. I'm a graduate of UCLA and Harvard University, and I'm thrilled to share these reflections on how we can heal with you today. Today, our guest is Dr. Bethany Brand. Dr. Bethany Brand is a clinical psychologist practicing in Towson, Maryland. As an expert in trauma, she specializes in the assessment and treatment of trauma-related disorders, including post-traumatic stress disorder and dissociative disorders. Dr. Brand is a full professor of psychology at Towson University and maintains an independent practice in clinical psychology in Towson, Maryland. She also serves as an expert witness in criminal, civil disability, and employment matters, and conducts research on the assessment and treatment of trauma-related disorders. She also provides consultation and supervision of psychology students, postdoctoral fellows, and licensed mental health professionals, and has presented research papers and clinical trainings all around the world. You can learn more about her and her work at bethanybrand.com and topddsteady.com. Bethany and I have connected many times through our work with the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, where she and her research have been recognized for their significant contributions to the fields of trauma and dissociation. I got to know her a little better when we were both presenting at a conference in Sydney in 2015. And I'm telling you, she is smart, warm, wise, and hilarious. Her passion and dedication to healing are palpable, which is why I'm so excited to share her with you today. Let's welcome Bethany to the show. Dr. Bethany Brand, I am so excited to have you on the How We Can Heal podcast. It's a privilege to have you here, and I'm excited to share you with people who know about you and your work and with people who don't know about you and your work, because it's pretty amazing. Aww, you're so kind, Lisa. Thank you. I just speak the truth. I just speak the truth. So I want to start with, you know, I feel like there's awareness about dissociation is growing. You know, I'm in the yoga world too, and people started to learn about trauma because they got on their yoga mats and they were like, what is this? It's happening. What am I processing? Right. And then people started to become more aware of like, well, what is this thing that that's different than maybe an activation trigger? What is this sort of going away? And even more, you know, I, I don't think there's as much awareness of DID, but there's starting to be an awareness of dissociation. So I'm curious for you, when did you, you've been researching dissociative disorders for a long time now. When did that start for you? When did that question around how can I measure this? How can I research this? How can I contribute to the field? Where did that seed sprout from? Well, in graduate school, I started with my master's on sexual abuse and risk factors in families that were sexually abusive. And in the process of grad school, Frank Putnam called into my department and asked for anybody who'd want to volunteer on his longitudinal research study. He was not well known at that point. I mean, yeah. I'm pretty old. This is going back a ways. Did anybody want to help him change the world? Um, his longitudinal study of girls who'd been sexually abused, comparing them to yeah. girls who were not sexually abused. And he and his team found out all kinds of things about that. Well, he's an expert in dissociation. So I was lucky to hear about it, but I was skeptical, to be honest, in the beginning, because of all the media stereotypes about DID and but I got very interested. And then on internship at George Washington University Hospital, I met my first person who said that they had DID. And I reached out to Judy Armstrong at Shepherd Pratt, who was doing some of the first research studies on psych testing and DID. And then I was fortunate enough to land a postdoc there. And I got my training in how do you work with DID and trauma-related disorders. And I kept thinking, we need research in this area. There's not enough research. And there wasn't, you know, yeah. I started there in 93. And that was a full-time job, a postdoc for two years and attending for four more years after that, five more years after that. And I became a professor at Towson University where I finally needed to do research. And I like, this is my opportunity. So that was back in 1998 that I started thinking about Let's figure out what research needs to be done and how to do it when there's no funding in the field for research on dissociative disorders. It sounds like there were some pivotal moments in there. Frank Putnam, you know, landing the postdoc, right? Kind of step by step. You look at the path, you know, in retrospect and it all fits together, right? The opportunity to take a deep dive into dissociation, into dissociative disorders. And from a research perspective, it's like there were all these little steps leading you 
into that direction. I'm curious if there was, was it mostly just that there isn't enough research in this area or was there anything else that motivated you to do the research that you've done? I'm actually not a statistician. I don't think that way. I'm not all that great (laughs) with running my own analyses, but I think about studies. We need to do this. I wonder if that contributes to this. And that's just how my brain works. And then Frank Putnam, (laughs) darn him, (laughs) bless him. Um, We we're at a conference together years later, and I was already doing the series of studies where I compare people with dissociative disorders to those who are imitating, faking. Mm, Yes, important research. Yeah, that's a whole other line of research. And Frank said to me, we need somebody to do a treatment study. We have not had treatment studies in this field. The last one had been 1997. And I'm like, Frank, there's no funding. How do you do research when there's no funding? Like, Treatment research is expensive, millions of dollars, but it got me thinking, and he was willing to be a consultant without charge, as Rich Lowenstein and Ruth Lanius and these other incredibly brilliant, gifted, compassionate, motivated people were, and so we figured it out. That's amazing. So tell us about the top DD study. What, uh, you know, it's been going for a long time now, as, as far as I understand it, you have a lot of iterations and things that you've studied over the years. Uh, when did it start and what was the focus? So top DD stands for treatment of patients with dissociative disorders. Um, and probably most of the listeners know there's been some debate for some time about whether people can even dissociate trauma memories. Some very vocal critics who publish a lot say, no, that's not possible. Um, They're wrong, but that is what they write. And the preponderance of research shows that actually you can dissociate traumatic memories and they can come back later or you can get snippets of them later. So I was interested in that. And then when Frank talked about top DD, I needed to start, or we as a team needed to start because that same group of critics, they also say or at least they used to write, they've softened on this because of the research. They used to write that if you treat dissociative disorders, especially DID, you'll make it worse. If you Hmm. pay attention to dissociation, and if you talk to people who say they have DID, they don't really necessarily even believe in DID, you'll make them worse. They'll have more amnesia, they'll hear voices more, they'll make more parts. They say it's all a socially constructed disorder. Interesting that's created by cultural influences, not trauma. So we had to start at the basics, which our first study was what's called a naturalistic study, where we just followed patients and their therapists, both patients and therapists reported on how the patient was doing over time, filling out validated questionnaires over 30 months. So we didn't interfere with the treatment and we didn't change the treatment. We didn't start treatment. They were already in treatment with the provider who blessed them both were willing to be in the study. We didn't have any money to pay people. And in that study, we showed all kinds of improvements. So these patients did not get worse. They stabilized self-harm. Self-harm went down, suicide attempts uh, trended down, hospitalizations went down, PTSD symptoms and dissociation both decreased, quality of life went up, adaptive functioning went up, They felt some periods of joy or positive emotion, which they'd been not having very much of. They were using drugs less often. So no way (laughs) were they getting worse. So that was the first step. Science has to move in in these little steps. It builds on itself. So we refuted all those myths. And then the next step after that was to do an intervention study. So we created this online treatment program. It's an educational program. There are not nearly enough therapists who know how to treat dissociation. Not nearly enough. We wanted a twofer. (laughs) I wanted to help the individuals living with dissociation. And I wanted to help, we as the team of top DD researchers, wanted to help train more clinicians about how you help dissociative folks, especially in that first stage of treatment, just getting stabilized, learning to to manage symptoms and not be so self-attacking, self-harm and suicide attempts. So we created this program, which we're now calling the program Finding Solid Ground. Nice. And it was in that first iteration of that online study, both patients and therapists had access to 45 different videos 
which were their short little educational videos that I made like 10 to 15 minute videos explaining step by step what trauma does to folks, what dissociation is, why it's an adaptive response when you're being traumatized, especially if you're a little kid and don't have other ways to protect yourself. Yes. And then things like why self-harm is so common uh, and poor self-care is so common amongst highly traumatized people. And then gradually moving to safety and how you might get safer. And that basically when people are being unsafe, they're meeting some need. So for an example, if somebody's hurting themselves, let's say, and this is a trigger warning, but let's say somebody's cutting themselves, they're doing it for a reason. It usually works pretty well to change emotions, change state, you know, some people do it to cause themselves to numb out and dissociate. Others do it to get out of dissociative state or, or all kinds of other reasons. Our number one reason from some later research we did recently is that for dissociative patients in our study, they said their number one trigger for self-harm was to get to manage in some way PTSD symptoms. Stop the awful pictures, to stop the thoughts. Okay. So we taught in that program, the online program, about other ways that are safer to manage PTSD symptoms. So they didn't have to use self-harm. And we taught them about grounding and had them work on developing plans for what worked. And we just encouraged and encouraged and encouraged them to keep trying. Try and find your own ways to manage grounding. We gave over a hundred suggestions, but then we wanted them to try it out. So each week there was a video with some educational material and then a journaling exercise where they could write and try and apply it to themselves. And then a practice exercise where go out and try it this week. Yeah. And each client therapist dyad team could figure out the pace at which they wanted to proceed through the material. And we had this great idea that we give them access to those 45 modules for a year, and then we'd follow them for a year because in research, you're supposed to follow them after the intervention to see do, does the improvement endure. Yes. We got feedback really fast from therapists and clients. Like we can't get through all these materials that fast and we don't want to lose access to this material. We don't want to whip through it, but we don't want to miss the later portions. And so we went back to my ethics board and we asked permission to allow them to have access to it for two years and no follow-up. We had to, I mean, so this is one of our mottos, um, learn together, heal together, work together, learn together, and now heal together. So we as researchers want to work with clients and their therapist to learn how to best help these individuals living with dissociation. We also want them, for those who have self-states, dissociative self-states, to learn to work together inside themselves, help each other and heal together. So it's multiple layers of feedback and collaboration. And so they were telling us like, too fast, we need longer, slower. Okay, you got it. So that was that first study. And once again, the results were very similar to the naturalistic study, is that people who stuck out the program for a year or two years they show decreased symptoms of all sorts, decreased self-harm, decreased dissociation, decreased PTSD, you know, just these great things, um, and improved emotion regulation. They were learning how to identify and tolerate. And our idea was gradually to help them not be so terrified and phobic of emotion and their bodies, but we did less on that because that's a big topic for many people. And it seemed to be really helpful. We got lots of feedback from people and the data showed it too. So then that was the naturalistic study. Then the online study where we tried out for the first time a version of finding solid ground. And then we got feedback about ways to improve it, not just the one I told you about where we made it longer, but other kinds of feedback too. So we did some revisions. And then we made the new program, which we're now running. It's the first rant. I, I, I get a little choked up. <laughs> yeah. I'm a little sappy about this, but not sappy. It means something. This is the first randomized controlled trial that's ever been run for people around the world who have dissociative symptoms and their therapist. 
And so it's called a randomized control trial, an RCT. And in the science world, you have to have RCT studies to prove that your treatment works. So you compare the treatment you want to study to another treatment, and you have to randomly assign people to groups. And if the one that got the treatment you're studying show improvements compared to the other group, then scientifically, it's valid to say the treatment caused the change improvements. So we're running an RCT where now we shortened the program because that was that was a lot to, for people to cover. And, you know, in two years time, some therapists move or clients moved or people lost their insurance or all kinds of things happen. Try to boil it down to what we figure are the 30 most important lessons. And there's 30 videos along with 30 journaling and practice exercises. And we've got right now, as of yesterday, it was 167 dyads from around the world. And like, truly, we're getting global representation. Nice. Making their way through the study. And, you know, we've got about another six months to recruit. So I, I literally have goosebumps. <laughs> That's incredible. It's huge. It's so significant and so impactful. So I could understand why, you know, I just even hearing it and thinking of, not only the people who are in the study, but all of the people that that then impacts, right? Once you collect the data and once you kind of draw some conclusions, share that with the clinical community. You know, when I think of folks who are dealing with dissociative disorders, I think of the people who have been the most harmed, often at the hands of other human beings, right? And so that's why I get passionate when people talk about PTSD, but don't talk about dissociation. If you say, oh, you know, this is good for people with PTSD, but it's really only good for people who, you know, had a pretty well adapted ish, however we want to call it, childhood, had a single event happen in their 20s, 30s, and they're, you know, they deserve treatment 100%. We all deserve help and support and we want to understand PTSD. But, but when folks in the science space or the clinical space are like, oh, I don't really get dissociative disorders or I don't know about that, I'm like we're also just neglecting. <laughs> the people who have been the most harmed. And so I get chills thinking about the attention that you're giving to this really important and hard to look at because it is about the people who have been, you know, exploited and harmed in these really horrific ways that are, you know, difficult, challenging, practically impossible without dissociating to live through, <laughs> very difficult even to be with as a therapist and sort of quote unquote treat from that perspective. And even difficult, I think, for people in mainstream science or mental health or definitely mainstream society to want to lean towards because it, it's harm, it's it's hurtful, it's distressing, right? So when I hear you talk about that, I just think of the depth of healing that can come from paying this really skillful attention, not only to what's happening to to cause dissociation, what, what shows up, you know, in the aftermath of it, but also how are people treating it? What's working? And then how can we share that information? Like that to me is just so much healing amplified. It's profound and impactful. Yep. I agree 100%. This time around, we are expanding who we're including. So in the other studies I talked about, we included people who had been diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder, DID, or what's called other specified dissociative disorder. This time we're also trying to see, does this program, the Finding Solid Ground program, does it help people who have complex PTSD or the dissociative and, the, or they don't have to have both, or the dissociative subtype of PTSD? So basically going back to what you were saying, what we know is that people who have that whole cluster of disorders tend to have had much more severe trauma, much more childhood trauma, and they dissociate. They have more problems with things like self-harm, with relationships, um, often suicidality at times. And because of all of that, they don't get included in standard PTSD treatment studies. They don't meet criteria for the other studies, which means that those studies results don't help us know how to help people who have been more harmed, as you were saying, and have more symptoms, more adaptations, more struggles. 
So it's exactly, I agree with you hundred percent that these are the folks that really need the help. And we as a mental health field have not done a very good job. And there've even been some that have been harmful. I've done some other studies where we ask people living with dissociation about their experiences in treatment, trying to get treatment. And the number of them that are saying things that they've been treated derisively, been called a liar, saying they're making it up, the disorder doesn't exist, it's shocking. It's wow. awful. So our field needs to get a whole lot better about understanding trauma and getting the word out there amongst clinicians. And a lot of times when I share or teach about what does trauma-informed mean, I come back to, you know, and this is true in the medical world and, and in mental health as well, our bottom line is usually to try to do no harm, right? Like at the very least, let's try to do no harm, but it happens in a lot of ways and it can happen just as a result of say someone going through a whole doctorate of psychology and not learning about trauma, right? Or what they learn. Like I've done some studies examining what psychology textbooks say about trauma and dissociation. And a lot of times we're finding there are books that are just propagating myths and not research-based information about dissociation. And it's just it's wrong. It's hurtful. It is hurtful to these people and the and the future therapist as they're studying. Like they're going to go out and practice with this, you know, bogus ideas that's they could be harmful. And this isn't like even 10, 20 years ago you're talking about. You're talking about still people who are in school today, right? Right. It's challenging. It, it is. And I remember looking into different programs and and going, okay, well, there's a you know, this is a doctorate of psychology. There's a course on CBT. There's a course on DBT. There's nothing in the curriculum about trauma and just sort of scratching my head. And as you know, I grew up with a mother who's a trauma therapist. So I'm just sitting here. Am I going to be the one in class that's like, raising? what about trauma? Yes. <laughs> what about trauma? How do you think that impact the body? How do you think the bodies impact and impact their emotions and their experience and their behavior? Like, I just like, to me, I'm like, it's so obvious. And I also think people who didn't grow up with a, you know, professional trauma therapist or a parent, once you learn it, it's like this light bulb and you go, oh, that makes so much sense. And for a lot of folks, that's, oh, that I make so much sense. Other people around me make so much sense, right? When you understand trauma, and I think when we're trauma-informed, dissociation-informed, attachment-informed, it's like this big frame to the puzzle. And then you can just start putting pieces where they fall. And then the picture gets really clear and you go, oh, oh okay, this is what's happening. Rather than just having that little piece and going, oh, there's this relational issue or there's this mood issue, right? You start to put it together and you go, oh, and this is where, you know, and I know Bruce Perry and Oprah wrote a book that focuses on what happened to you, that question, right? Like we start to look at, whoa, what happened is a really big, you know, what's happening and what's the environment. And, you know, I always like to throw in the question, well, so what's right with this person? What's right with their adaptation, right? How are they adapting to perhaps a really toxic or horrific or traumatic environment? So, yeah, <laughs> I get passionate about this stuff with you. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank goodness, right? I mean, that's what it's going to take to change the world. There's going to have to be a lot of passionate people working for it. So I'm curious, when do people ask you about how to differentiate, like, okay, there's PTSD in the subtype, the dissociative subtype now, which is in the DSM, and then there's dissociative disorders or DID or DDNOS. Do people ask you to differentiate those? And, and what what's your perspective there? Um, there was this big meta-analysis done recently. Um, a meta-analysis is when some researchers gather up all kinds of studies that have examined the same thing using similar enough methodology that they can combine their data. And what they ended up basically showing is, is something that a lot of us were trained in some years ago, but there's data. And it's, you know, it's always very compelling <laughs> when there's a lot of data from around the world over decades that show something, then it's like, okay. <laughs> So there's a continuum of dissociation found. It's not just in trauma disorders. Lysenko and all found that dissociation occurs in most, a little bit, in most of the disorders recognized in the DSM. Bipolar was the lowest level way down here. So I'm making a continuum if anybody's looking at their screen. At the lowest level was bipolar. And then at the very highest level, all these studies amassed that showed that D, people with DID have the highest level of dissociation. So they use it the most, tends to be the most frequent, 
and most severe highest levels, according to this measure called the dissociative experiences scale. And then a step away from that, dropping down a bit was overall dissociative disorders and then borderline personality disorders in here somewhere, but PTSD is in there. And so you get the trauma related disorders at the highest level of dissociation. And then there's moderate levels. For example, when people have panic attacks, they often have dissociation. So that doesn't mean they have a dissociative disorder. It means that under stress, parts of their brain start acting differently, they dissociate. And people, you know, who have schizophrenia have some dissociation that's higher than, you know, down here at the end of the continuum bipolar. And so one of the things I suggest to clinicians or clients or individuals out there, if they want to have a sense for how roughly a sense for where the person's level of dissociation is, there are questionnaires they can fill out. You know, I think for many individuals living with dissociative symptoms, it's helpful to actually talk to a clinician and, and look at that together to figure out what that means. The one I mentioned, dissociative experiences scale, actually, I don't think I said its name. That's Frank Putnam's measure. It's the most used personal, it's the most used self-report measure of dissociation in the world. And that's what Lysenko and his group studied. And you can find that online. <laughs> yeah. And we can find a, a link and put it in the show notes as well. Right, so great. folks can go directly to that. So in your research or in your you know, analysis of research, what have you found to be the most effective treatments or sort of go-to modalities or, you know, ways to train therapists, what stands out on that side? Okay. So the group of us, a subset of the top DD researchers did just publish the program called Finding Solid Ground. So there's a therapist book. So if there's any clinicians out there who want to start learning about dissociation, that's one of the good books. There's other ones out there too. And then there's a patient workbook that goes with it. Finding Solid Ground Workbook. So you don't have to be in the study to get access to that program, but the videos are only available through the research study. We hope at some point, if they seem to be effective in this RCT, maybe we'll figure out a way to also make those available. Anyway, I'm emphasizing the program because right now it's the only evidence-supported treatment program for, level, for people with high levels of dissociation. Hmm. So we emphasize um, main skills, including getting grounded, learning ways to, instead of dissociating, get grounded in present reality, being aware of the current date, where you actually are, um, your current age. And uh, this is the harder part is for some people is being in their bodies gradually, bit by bit. And we teach that in little steps. So it's not overwhelming. Um, so grounding and why they might want to be grounded, but we also recognize throughout the program, there's really good reasons you've not wanted to be grounded. And so we have them journal about that. What are the reasons you've not wanted to be grounded? How does being ungrounded or dissociated help you? So we want that to be acknowledged. And if they're in therapy, they can talk about that and show the workbook writing, um, share it with their therapist if they choose. Um, but also then we present some potential downsides to being dissociated. Like I'm still doing therapy with clients. So I was talking earlier today with the client. She's so disconnected from her body that she doesn't feel thirst. So she can go 17, 18, 19, 20 hours without any intake of liquids. I'm like, oh, that, that is so unhealthy, right? So I have to calm myself down. <laughs> because I care about her and I want her kidneys and the rest of her to last a good, long, healthy life. But we teach things like that. We teach about healthy needs and what are they in the program and how to get healthy needs met safely. So not just through self-harm, not just through dissociation, but other ways. So emotion, awareness, acceptance, regulation, grounding, what are healthy needs and how do you get them met? And then how do you manage symptoms like PTSD and dissociation? Those are just crucial elements of the first stage of treatment for complex trauma. There's two sort of mantras that I use a lot with folks. And one of them is 
what's happening right now. And, you know, there can be a lot happening right now internally with PTSD or dissociation, but like really physically in the environment, what's happening right now, you know, okay, well, the, the lights on and the trees are swaying and right. Sort of just any neutral thing to step into what's, what's actually happening right now. Cause usually if you're in a therapy session, the immediate environment is kind of neutral or safe enough. Right. So what's happening right now. And um, also a, a good one that goes with that is that's not happening right now, <laughs> right? Like something else that maybe it's a, a worry based on trauma or maybe it's a flashback or maybe something like, oh, that's actually not happening right now. And then the other one that I was thinking of as you were talking is, what do I need right now? Yeah. Let's just start, well, what do you need right now? Oh, I need rest or I need a break or I need some water or I can't tell you the amount of times I've been with a client and you know, I'll maybe have a sense of like, what did you eat today? And then they stop and go, hmm coffee? <laughs> right? And you're like, exactly. it's 2 p.m. and maybe some food would be a good idea, right? So just going back to some of those sometimes really basic needs, like you were saying, water, food, sleep. Sleep can be disrupted as a result of a lot of these things, right? So that could be a tough one. But just going back to like maybe a breath, maybe a little stretch, maybe just noticing I'm clenching a lot and shaking a little bit of that out. I mean, all of these things, the more somatic and embodied they are, the more you work towards them over time. But just coming back to that, what's happening right now, what's not happening right now, and what do I need right now? Those I've found to be like on repeat, <laughs> right? <laughs> I love and they just resonate with everything that you're sharing. So um, say the name of the book again for folks who are, are looking for it. Finding Solid Ground. If you search for those keywords, it'll show up both the therapist book and the workbook. Nice. That's cool. Overcoming obstacles and trauma treatment is the second part. You know, we often have colons. <laughs> yes. Always the extra title. <laughs> extra title. We need to get it in there. <laughs> So you're doing the randomized control trial right now. You said you've got about six more months of recruiting. We think so. I mean, we didn't expect maybe even after a year to have this many people. We love it. In stats, the higher your sample size, the more able you are to find effects because you have more power for any stats people out there. So um, I think we'll go for a full year, even though we can probably run the stats now, but we really, we want big enough subgroups for each of those other disorders I talked about. Yeah. yeah. And you know, yeah. we need more men. There's not as many men. It's, it's harder to recruit men into mental health treatment studies. Yeah. For a whole host of reasons yeah. we could get into, but I want to, I'm curious about you mentioned having the researcher's brain and the research studies just popping up. I would guess that you're like five research studies ahead in your brain of what you want to do next and what you want to do next and what you want to do next. Is there any of that that you can share with us now of what, what you feel like comes next? Well, I actually have five lines of research that are currently going on. <laughs> so one is analyzing current day textbooks again to see if our earlier studies have helped shape the textbooks. And if not, we're going to be writing the publishers and the authors once again saying, guess what? You are out of step with evidence and research. Yes. And last time the trauma division of the American Psychological Association gave out awards to the best textbooks. We're doing everything we can to change textbooks and what people learn. I'm still analyzing the data from that. Here's what genuine dissociative disorders look like. Here's what imitated dissociative disorders look like. So I'm still publishing some stuff there. And where that helps is figuring out for the mental health clinicians, which are valid measures that are good at picking up on and describing dissociation. There are what are called validity subscales on some tests. And if you endorse too many symptoms, like if you endorse some, let's just say a, a questionnaire has questions about de depression, anxiety, feeling suicidal, maybe hearing voices, maybe having flashbacks, all kinds of things that go along with trauma. If they include a bunch of symptoms or experiences, the world around you feeling unreal. If they endorse enough of those items on one of these validity scales, that test may then classify them incorrectly as exaggerating symptoms. Uh, okay. I'm doing a lot of work, my research team and I, we're doing a lot to try and show these are the tests that are actually valid with dissociative disorders. These are the ones that are not. 
and should not be used with dissociative people because they have used too many items that are elevated or that go along with being exposed to trauma. Where that becomes really important in the criminal justice arena, I do some forensic work, and sometimes those people end up a highly dissociative person who ends up there at trial may show no emotion. And sometimes the prosecution says, look, this person has no emotion. They're antisocial. They're a sociopath. Right. That's a whole nother line of work where I try and, and I, with different attorneys, different teams, actually help people, their lives be saved. Nice. So it will take us a couple of years to analyze all the data. First, you know, we have to recruit for another six months, and then you have to clean the data for a while, um, organize and, and do all sorts of work to the data and start analyzing it. And then publishing it usually takes two or three years. So believe it or not, the RCT results are not going to be out for quite a while. Um, but of course, we're already dreaming about next steps. Yes. This Finding Solid Ground program is about the stabilization of people with high dissociation related to trauma. We are getting lots of requests for, can you help with other things too? Can you figure out and make a program for other things? So we did a little bit in terms of helping people with PTSD. Maybe we, maybe we'll make a program that's specifically about that. We've also heard requests about help me understand and help my client who has dissociative self states. Mm. Maybe we can figure out a way to do that. That's not too triggering. It's awfully hard to make these programs because we're not seeing these people face to face. We can't assess. Yeah. Are we going too fast? Are we going too slow? Is this, does this explanation even fit this individual or not? Um, so it is yeah. really tricky as the creator, one of the creators of this program to figure out how to do that in a way that's helpful, but not too much. I mean, I think that's the biggest challenge, especially when it comes to education around this, is that that attunement, going back to being attachment informed, that attunement to someone and that nonverbal and at times verbal communication around too much, too little, are we going the right pace is such a big part of any kind of trauma treatment. Even in the diet, it can be challenging to figure out. But then the further you step back, the more challenging it is to figure that out. Is this too much? Is this too little? I mean, that's something I'm constantly sort of leaning into and out of like, okay, is this too much? Is it, oh, that's too much. Okay. And that's, oh no, maybe that's too little. Okay. And you're just constantly trying to, to refine it. So yeah, the, the further you step back, the harder that's going to be. That's exactly right. We, we've, um, one thing I didn't mention is we've had people with lived experience who have, for example, we had a panel of people with DID who reviewed all of our materials and gave us feedback on it before we even launched that online study. And then the co-PI of the top DD study, his name is Dr. Hugo Shulka. He ran pilot groups with patients at a state psychiatric hospital to get live feedback as he actually did the program. Um, and we learned a lot from that. So this new program is adapted, but we would have to go through that whole process again of getting lots of feedback, trying it out. It's, it's not a fast process. <laughs> It is not. And I just kudos to you for the diligence and the patience that goes into all of that. I mean, I spill water trying to water my plants too fast. So I don't know why. I don't know if I'm the right person to be on your team. I'm like, come on, come on, let's go. Well, I'm also known for my energy and zeal. So I have to be careful with my own clients and with the study. Good. Take a few deep breaths and reel it in, right? And just keep that one step at a time. With that one study, I thought it was perfectly reasonable to ask people to do 45 modules of work. It's a 52-week year. That gives them time for illness and vacation. <laughs> oh, and then you get the feedback and you go, okay, fine, two years. Fine. Okay. Okay. And then we even chunked it down to 30 modules, right? Yeah. yeah. We're learning. You guys out there, you're teaching us. We're learning. We're trying. Well, I mean, it makes me think too that you just you can't rush healing as much as we want to because there is so much. I mean, as as an individual, you know, trying to healing something 
personal, we often want to like get to the end, right? Because it's uncomfortable. It's painful. Same thing with things like this. There's so much discomfort and pain and, and suffering at times even at stake that we're like, come on, let's just, let's just get it done. <laughs> let's just know the answer. Let's just move forward. And so that pacing for all of us can be a challenge just to, you know, have a lot of energy for something and then maintain it over time. It makes me think of like, running an ultra marathon or something where, you know, you know, you got 30 miles, you know, you got 50 miles, no rush, right? You just got to take it one step at a time. So do you mind if I jump in there? Because it's a perfect, what you've just said. Clinicians, of course, want to help clients get better as soon as possible, right? Of course we do. There's a group that are pushing hard to create ultra brief treatments, even for DID. And they've written that they, about a case where they report they've cured DID in eight sessions. That is so extremely alarming to me. Yeah. They say they didn't need to do any stabilizing therapy. And yet what they describe is that this person had been in treatment for years, EMDR treatment, that they had been in treatment and gotten sober with drinking but they don't acknowledge that was stabilizing and that the, in order to do those things, that person had to make a lot of progress. But the authors poo-poo that prior treatment and say it didn't help. And then they say in eight ultra marathon days, they did EMDR and prolonged exposure every day. Okay, I have something to say about this. Wait, so- and this is my opinion. <laughs> I have this picture of a friend, a friend of a friend, you know, I actually do enjoy uh, or used to, I don't really do long runs as much anymore, but I still love going on the trails all day. And so I have friends who are ultra marathon runners, right? And we run to the top of this mountain nearby called Mount Diablo. And sometimes uh, seasonally it has tarantulas. (laughs) I'm not the biggest fan of tarantulas, but I have this picture of her holding a tarantula in her hand. Right. And she's going like this. And for folks listening, I'm kind of leaning back and like gritting my teeth. She's like leaning away from it, holding it in her hand like, ah, Ah. right. And that to me, I always use this when I'm teaching and I ask permission for it because I think, you know, my friend posted on Facebook or something. I was like, that picture. I'm using that picture. (laughs) That's a great. (laughs) Yes. So, and I just ask folks, I'm like, okay, if prolonged exposure is trying to measure trauma symptoms, right? Oh, your symptoms went away. And I don't know the study you're describing, but if this, if the go-to for someone is to dissociate, which is essentially to make the symptoms of trauma go away, right? <laughs> to use an internal, you know, method or or a switch or you know way of managing to not feel right. Right. right exactly. So you put the tarantula in your hand. And someone says, oh, I don't feel anything. You bring it closer. I don't feel anything. I don't feel anything. Well, my first question is, are you dissociating, right? right? Do you love tarantulas or are you dissociating? And so when I hear about prolonged exposure studies, I'm always curious, and I'd be curious about this one that you're sharing now, how are they measuring for dissociation and how are they measuring improvement? Because if you're measuring improvement as symptoms going down, well, what are those symptoms? Are those symptoms of intrusions? Are those symptoms of anxiety? Are those symptoms of hyperarousal? Because I would expect those to go down with exposure, right? I would expect dissociation to go up. So are you also measuring, and, and you were saying this was treating DID, right, in eight sessions. So I'd be curious, how were they measuring that, that resolution? What did it look like? Because what I've seen way too often is folks go into some kind of treatment that's, you know, the clinician really believes it's going to make them better. They believe it's going to make them better. They go in and then they just leave feeling numb, which can look on a measure standpoint like better, but is not better, (laughs) is right back where you started from. And maybe even backsliding if folks have been sort of learning to manage the in-between a little bit better, right? So always think of that tarantula in the hand, like (laughs) bringing it closer is going to, you know, maybe bring more and more and more hyper arousal. And then at a certain point, if dissociation especially is your go-to, we're just going to clamp it down and feel nothing and be like, it's fine. The tarantula's in my face. I'm fine. And what is that? That's dissociation, right? Or that's, it's just a different way to cope that we might not be measuring. So oh, super important. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And I'm not saying this just to, you know, I haven't read the study that you're talking about, so I don't know, but I would be really curious about a lot of these things too. I'd be really curious about that. So I know we've got to wrap up soon, and I'm just curious, what do you wish everyone knew about trauma and dissociation? You have so much experience. You've had your eyes and hands and so much research. What do you wish 
everyone in the planet knew about these things. Mm. Wow. <laughs> I, I cannot just boil it down to one thing, but I wish everybody understood that dissociation is an extremely common way to survive incredible stress, including trauma, and that you can learn to befriend your body and your emotions and gradually heal if you, for a time, had to dissociate a lot. Because when you dissociate a lot, you're disconnecting from all kinds of good feelings and you're disconnecting at some level from other people. You're disconnecting within yourself. So much of life's richness, they've had to disconnect from. And it's an amazing thing as a clinician to see people starting to connect and feel emotions, feel good, learn to gradually make some healing, healthy relationships. It's incredible. It's awesome. It's inspiring. People can heal from trauma and dissociation. It's possible, but not yes. rapidly. It takes work, but it can happen. Well, the next thing I was going to ask you is what you would say to someone who maybe is realizing they're struggling with this personally or, you know, a friend or a family member. So I think that message is spot on of just knowing that it, it doesn't often happen immediately, especially if there's been a long history sort of leading towards what people are experiencing. But it is possible. Totally possible. And especially if you can find a therapist, if you can afford therapy, get into therapy with somebody who has been trained in trauma and dissociation. 100%. And I'll put the um, ISSTD find a therapist link as well in the show notes. What brings you hope? Doing this work, changing the world and seeing, look, this treatment helps. It helps a lot of people. I get the emails from some of the participants. There's a woman in Norway who asked to go through the study and she's completely changed her life. She's written a book about it. She talks about it now. Not everybody's going to have that kind of reaction, but it I has made huge differences for people who actually do the work with a therapist who helps them do the work. We haven't yet tested it with people doing it on their own. Yeah, that would be more challenging. Yeah, it would. A lot more. Yeah, it's like trying to do EMDR on yourself. Right, right. <laughs> really, or do your own haircut, especially the back parts. <laughs> right, you're like, it looks fine, right? No. <laughs> that front side looks kind of good. My bangs are okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, how can people connect with you? How can they support your work? Donate to Top DD. They can go to topddstudy.com. And I have a website too, bethanybrand.com. So I have all kinds of resources on there. I have a bunch of publications listed, all sorts of things. Also for people who want to learn more about trauma or who want to teach about trauma, I keep up a website called teachtrauma.com. There's all hmm. kinds of evidence-based <laughs> summaries of research. There's PowerPoint slides, professors, teachers can use the materials, people who train other clinicians can use the materials. There's all kinds of free good stuff there. Amazing. And that was teachtrauma.com? Yep. Okay. .com. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Bethany Brand. I just am so grateful that you exist in this world and that you're doing all the work you're doing. I know you're doing it with other people. So shout out to them too. Just so appreciate all the dedication and consistency. And I hope you, you know, get a break yourself too sometimes <laughs> more than the five minutes I'm about to give you right now. <laughs> I'm a gardener. I kayak. I do self-care too. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. It's been a blast talking to you, Lisa. Thank you for the work that you do and getting word out through your podcast and your books. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening. My hope is that you walk away from these episodes feeling supported and like you have a place to come to find the hope and inspiration you need to take your next small step forward. For more information and resources, please visit my website, howwecanheal.com. There, you'll find tons of helpful resources and the full transcript of each show. You can also click the podcast menu to submit requests for upcoming topics and guests. I look forward to hearing your ideas.